Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome Larry Chamley. Uh, he's also a director of the Hub of EV Investigations in New Zealand. Larry is a reproductive biologist and a productive immunologist whose research focuses on the role of EVs in pregnancy and disease of pregnancy. So Larry completed his PhD in the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, before getting a HRCNZ Fellowship to study reproductive immunology at the University of Liverpool in the UK. He returned to Auckland to work as a research fellow and then lecturer and is currently the head of the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology. He's the newly appointed editor of Trophoblast Research and an associate editor of Reproduction. So please welcome Larry. Today he's going to present uh, his talk and educate us on the placental extracellular vesicles, controllers of maternal adaptations to pregnancy. So thank you, Carolina, for inviting me along today. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for those of you who have come along. Uh, it's a beautiful morning here in Auckland, in New Zealand, Tuesday morning. Um, and good evening to you if you're in the States or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, and if you're a European extracellular vesicle researcher, you are a very dedicated researcher and uh, pleasure to have you here. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, placental extracellular vesicles and the role that they play in controlling the maternal adaptations to pregnancy. So just in case there are some of you here who are new to uh, EV research, just to remind you that extracellular vesicles are lipid encapsulated structures. They contain proteins, lipids, small and long RNAs and DNA and actually a bunch of other stuff. Um, and any or all of those components can be bioactive in the vesicles. EVs are extruded uh, from almost all, if not all cells from all kingdoms. Um, but if we're looking at eukaryote cells then the, the uh, cells typically extrude two different types of vesicles. Um, Micro vesicles and nano vesicles is how I'm going to refer to them today, separated by, um, by their size and partly by their, um, their biogenesis. Uh, and I just point out that the uh, relatively recently published MICEV guidelines would prefer that we use the terms large extracellular vesicle and small extracellular vesicle, uh, but I'm by and large going to stick to the micro and nano today because I'm showing you um, some material that um, predates these uh, terminologies of uh, MICEV. So let's just turn for a moment to have a look at, um, at pregnancy. So pregnancy is an absolutely amazing state. So um, you look at pregnant women and by and large, not always, but by and large, they, um, they look amazing. Uh, and maybe not feel amazing all the time, but there are some incredible processes going on inside a pregnant woman to accommodate pregnancy. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you today about two of the adaptations that mum has to undergo to accommodate pregnancy. The first of those is the adaptation of the maternal immune system. So if you think about a natural conception, you have mum and you have dad, uh, and between them, they produce the baby uh, and the baby's placenta. And that is related to both mum and dad. So in effect, that is a tissue allograft. So you can't take dad's heart or his kidneys and graft them into mum and have them survive for nine months. That just doesn't work. The immune system recognizes them as being foreign and rejects them. But you can transplant the fetus and its placenta into a mother. And somehow or other, the maternal immune system is tolerized to the placenta to the paternal antigens that are present in the placenta and fetus, and she does not see them. The second adaptation that I'm going to talk to you very briefly about is the adaptation of the maternal cardiovascular system. So again, if you think about pregnancy, you've got a baby or a fetus, um, which is going to be around sort of seven pounds and another pound of placenta. So that's around about three to four kilos of extra tissue that has to um, be fed by mum and oxygenated. And so uh, in order to do that, mum increases the amount of blood that she has. Uh, and there's a, a, a quite a substantial change that occurs to the maternal cardiovascular system to accommodate pregnancy. So uh, 
here is a human placenta for those of you who are not familiar with it. So uh, this is a term placenta. It's lying uh, maternal aspect up. So this side of the placenta was facing mum uh, and baby was behind it in the uh, amniotic fluid. The little patches of blood that you can see here are maternal blood. So the placenta in a human is completely bathed in maternal blood. So the fetal tissue is in direct contact with the maternal blood and therefore the maternal immune system. So if we look at the uh, placenta histologically, you can see that it's made up of these uh, branching tree-like structures or villi. And they are covered by a most amazing cell, the syncytia trophoblast. So the syncytia trophoblast is a single cell. So the placenta only has one of them and it covers the entire surface of the placenta. So at term, we're looking at a single cell that has a surface area of somewhere between 11 and 13 square meters, or somewhere between 120 and 140 square feet. It is an amazingly large single cell. So here we see in this histology image, the syncytia trophoblast completely surrounding this villus, and these spaces would have been full, filled with maternal blood. I just want to draw your attention to this little structure so you can see that there are multiple nuclei inside it. It's protruding out into the maternal blood spaces and it has a bit of a tenuous connection with the uh, placenta itself with the syncytia trophoblast. And so if we look at that as a cartoon, we see that we have the syncytia trophoblast here covering the surface of the placenta. So this is a fetal cell in direct contact with the maternal blood out here, and it is extruding three types of vesicles. So um, firstly, we see the extrusion of um, these macro vesicles, those very large vesicles that I pointed to in the histology slide. And what you can see in this um, confocal uh, image is that we have a very large structure. This one is about 70 micrometers in its longest axis, uh, and it contains about 60 intact nuclei. And that, that's relatively typical for these macro vesicles, which are extruded from the syncytium into the maternal blood. And then we also have typical uh, micro vesicles or large extracellular vesicles, as well as typical small extracellular vesicles or nano vesicles. Now, it turns out that the placenta is a very, very generous source of uh, extracellular vesicles, as one of my colleagues keeps reminding me. Uh, and it turns out that each day at 12 weeks of gestation, so that's quite early in pregnancy, we're seeing around about 6 times 10 to the 14 large EVs being extruded into the maternal blood uh, and about um, 2 times 10 to the 14 of the small EVs. These very large macro vesicles, there are about 50,000 of them uh, at 12 weeks of gestation, and there'll be 10 times more of them at, at term being extruded into the maternal blood. Now, we know about macro vesicles from this uh, chap, George Small, who is one of my science heroes. So Small was a uh, pathologist, a German pathologist, working 130-odd um, years ago now. Uh, and he was a very clever man. So these are Schmall's images. And what he was doing was looking in the lungs of women who had died during or shortly after pregnancy. And when he looked in the lungs, he saw these structures here, um, which I'm going to refer to today as macro vesicles. And they reminded him of these little structures that um, were present in the placenta that he saw loosely attached to the placenta. And he made that connection and said, these structures have come from the placenta. So these macro vesicles are very large and they travel from the placenta. So the veins that drain the uterus right up to the placental surface are quite large and easily accommodate these uh, macro vesicles. So they travel down the uterine um, veins into the vena cava, straight through the heart, and to the lungs, where they encounter the first small vascular bed that they see after leaving the placenta. And the vast majority of these macro vesicles get stuck in the maternal lungs, and very few of them pass into the peripheral blood. So we got interested in uh, studying these macro vesicles about 20 years ago, 
The difficulty is because they are stuck in the maternal lungs, it's difficult to find a source of them. And uh, what we did with a PhD student, uh, Muhammad Abamari, and my clinical uh, collaborator, Peter Stone, was to come up with this model where we would take a piece of placenta, a placental explant of about 400 milligrams. We would dissect it from the placenta and place it into these net well uh, chambers, which have an open 400 micron mesh at the bottom. And so the vesicles that fall from the placenta are able to freely pass through this mesh and into the plate beneath. And we typically culture these overnight just for convenience. We then uh, aspirate the conditioned medium and subject it to differential centrifugation, producing macro vesicles with a low speed spin and then uh, micro and nano vesicles um, separately. So we're able to generate uh, a nice source of those vesicles. And Schmall had told us that the uh, macro vesicles travel primarily to the lungs and remain in the maternal lungs. Now we uh, study systemic diseases or systemic conditions. So the immune system is not confined to the maternal lungs and certainly the cardiovascular system is not. And so we wanted to know um, where those vesicles go. And this is a sort of experiment we did knowing what the outcome was going to be. So we knew that the, the macro vesicles would go to the maternal lungs. It was a nice control. And um, being the clever soul that I am, I thought, well, the micro vesicles and the nano vesicles, they will pass through the lungs quite freely and spread themselves around the maternal body. And so it was almost not worth doing this experiment because we already knew the answer, or so I thought. So what we did was to take our um, vesicles from the model I've just shown you. Um, we labeled them with a far red stain, and then we injected them into pregnant mice a little after mid gestation and we allowed the vesicles to circulate for 30 minutes or 24 hours. At the end of the experiment, we uh, dissected out a bunch of uh, organs in the placenta. We then imaged them using an IVS kinetic imager and looked at where those vesicles had gone around the body. And this work was done by then PhD student in the lab, uh, Mansi Tong. Mansi is now in Vicky Abraham's lab at Yale. So what Mansi saw was with the macro vesicles exactly what we expected. So here we have the uh, different organs that we looked in. And at 30 minutes, as you can see, the vesicles, the macro vesicles were essentially localized in the left and right lungs. And relatively, there was, there was essentially this is background around the rest of the body. And when we looked at 24 hours, we saw um, a very similar pattern where the macro vesicles were essentially localized in the lungs, exactly as Schmall had said they were in women. We then did another uh, control. So uh, we injected the mice with uh, 200 micron uh, beads just as a control to see where they would go because we expected that um, Particles of this size would be treated as particulate antigens and be dealt with by the immune system um, largely in the spleen. And so that's exactly what happened. We saw these vesicles going to the liver and to the spleen. And when we looked at 24 hours, we saw exactly the same pattern of distribution. So that was quite reassuring. However, when we looked at the micro vesicles at 30 minutes, I was really quite surprised to see that there was a very limited distribution of these vesicles around the maternal body. And just like the macro vesicles, they were primarily localized in the maternal lungs. When we looked at 24 hours, again, the vesicles were still primarily localized in the lungs, but now uh, we had seen movement of some of those vesicles through to the liver. But essentially, there were none detectable in the rest of the maternal body. So what about nanovesicles? Well, again, surprisingly at 30 minutes, they were primarily localized to the maternal lungs. Uh, but this time we saw um, quite a lot of them also in the liver. And at 24 hours, we saw a very similar pattern of distribution with a lot still in the lungs. Um, still a predominance in the liver, but also now we saw them in the left and right kidneys. 
So not quite the pattern of distribution that um, I had been expecting. And so to summarize what we saw was that um, for the micro vesicles or large extracellular vesicles, they were predominantly in the lungs at 30 minutes and the lungs and liver at 24 hours. Whereas the small extracellular vesicles, the nano vesicles were in the lungs and liver at 30 minutes. And we saw movement to the kidneys um, by 24 hours. Now that started us thinking um, a little bit about biodistribution studies of the sort that we had carried out. And I just want to um, uh, move in a second to, to look more generally at biodistribution. But the thing that really struck me here was that um, the micro and nano vesicles were not localized generally around the body. And particularly what struck me was that they were not localized to the spleen where I would have expected them to go to be processed by the immune system as particulate antigens. Because we had seen this sort of um, somewhat surprising uh, biodistribution, um, a current PhD student in the lab, Matt Kang, undertook a, uh, a systematic review of the literature of studies that have looked at the biodistribution of small EVs, of nanovesicles in the body. Um, and Matt looked in the end at about 40 papers that have vesicles coming from various sources and were administered either IV or IP into rodents. And this is a sort of a heat map um, of what uh, he found from all of those papers, regardless of where the vesicles were derived from, they primarily localized to the liver uh, across this time course of up to about 48 hours, in fact. And the same organs that we saw involved, uh, with the exception of the spleen, were also um, the predominant uh, place where vesicles distributed to around the body of a rodent when they're injected. So these top four organs are uh, this is probably, in my opinion, not um, targeting of vesicles. This is probably about the clearance of vesicles. Uh, and so when we do these types of experiments, I think we need to be a little bit careful about the way that we interpret them. So one of the problems with the uh, biodistribution experiment that we had done is there is uh, quite a substantial literature from some very respectable groups, as well as from our own, showing that placental vesicles interact with various types of leukocytes. So this image is uh, from a paper by Muhammad Abamari, who had taken uh, placental vesicles and labeled them with a red stain and primary human macrophages here in green. Uh, and Muhammad showed that these uh, vesicles were phagocytosed by the macrophages and were internalized. And we know this is internalization because we can Z stack through that and we can inhibit the uptake with inhibitors. Um, and, but this is just an example. So others have shown interactions of these vesicles with T cells, with B cells, with natural killer cells, with macrophages and with neutrophils. So essentially um, most of the cells that are present in the immune system, at least in vitro, interact with these vesicles. And so as a result of those biodistribution studies, we asked what happens in vivo? Is the interaction different in vivo to what we see in vitro? So I'm gonna show you a series of experiments now that were conducted by uh, quite an amazing technician in the lab, Song Pak, um, where we did uh, a head-to-head -head comparison of in vitro and in vivo interactions of placental um, extracellular vesicles with uh, the maternal immune system or with the immune system. So what we did was to take our placental explant model. Uh, this time we used a different stain, which is taken up into the syncytia trophoblast, that cell that lines the placenta. And when, it's, when the cell tracker red is inside the syncytia trophoblast, the vesicles that are shed or extruded from the placenta are also labeled red and we can visualize those by flow cytometry or by microscopy. So we isolated our vesicles and I'm gonna to talk to you today about micro vesicles in this part of the talk. And so we isolated them by differential centrifugation. And then we split the prep. 
And part of that prep was injected, as I've just described, into mice. These were actually non-pregnant mice just for convenience. And the other part of the prep, we then tested in vitro. So what we did for these experiments was to harvest blood from a mouse and then ex extract the uh, leukocytes, and this is uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells plus neutrophils that we have in these cultures. And then we tried to match the amount of microvesicles that we had injected in vivo to the amount of uh, equivalent leukocytes that were present in our in vitro experiments and see what happened. So we then took the, uh, at the end of the experiment, uh, we took the leukocytes that have been exposed to vesicles either in vitro or in vivo, and we analyzed them for flow cytometry, looking for cells that had, uh, or that were associated with the labeled microvesicles. So these, are, these experiments are somewhat challenging because this is quite an atypical flow cytometry experiment where um, we're trying to work out, uh, are these cells associated with vesicles? It's quite hard to determine where we should set the positive and negative cutoff in these experiments, but we chose to set this gate uh, and here you can see from the in vitro experiment some leukocytes that contain or are associated with um, microvesicles. When we did the same in, with the in vivo exposed leukocytes, what you can see is there are substantially fewer cells that contain um, microvesicles than when we do the exposure in vitro. And when you think about this, this is not even vaguely surprising really, because here in the static culture system, uh, the vesicles are exposed to cells that can't escape from them, and there's going to be an interaction. Whereas in the in vivo situation, you have a flow system where the vesicles and the cells are both moving with much less chance for prolonged interaction. So there was a significantly reduced interaction of leukocytes in the in vivo experiment with vesicles compared to when we uh, did the experiment in vitro. That was at 30 minutes, and we saw exactly the same thing when we did the experiment for 24 hours. Again, there was this time a, a really significant interaction uh, of the vesicles with leukocytes in vitro, and almost nothing happening when we exposed the um, immune system to the vesicles in vivo. Uh, and again, you can see that uh, significant difference. Now we did these experiments using non-pregnant mice just because uh, of convenience. And we wanted to ask the question, um, what happens if we use pregnant mice? Is there a greater uh, interaction of the vesicles with the leukocytes in a pregnant mouse because of the altered environment that you have in pregnancy with progesterone and estrogen and all sorts of other things floating about in the maternal body that might modify the maternal immune system? And so we repeated those in vivo experiments. Uh, and here you can see the results that when we look at 30 minutes, there is an increased interaction of placental vesicles with the immune, uh, with leukocytes uh, in pregnant animals at both 30 minutes and at 24 hours. Now I also wanna point out to you this axis. So uh, here we have 0.8% of the leukocytes. So what you're seeing here is that we're not even getting to a 1% interaction of the leukocytes with vesicles. So less than 1% of the vesicles, even in a pregnant mouse, in fact, it's 0.1% of the vesicles are interacting with maternal leukocytes. But we do see the stronger interaction of uh, placental EVs with leukocytes in pregnant mice than we see in non-pregnant mice. So something about the uh, maternal environment of pregnancy is altering that interaction. So what are those leukocytes that are interacting with the vesicles? Well, the ones that we could identify were firstly a small population of B cells that were interacting with the placental vesicles and also a small population of monocytes that were interacting with um, vesicles. We didn't, well, we weren't able to detect an interaction with T cells, uh, NK cells or neutrophils. Okay, so that's what's happening in the circulation, but the immune system is not confined to the circulation. Much of it is present in tissues. And so 
What about the interaction of uh, EVs with cells in tissues? And so what we did was once we'd harvested uh, the organs from these animals was we uh, looked, uh, sectioned the tissues and then looked microscopically. And I'm just gonna show you a few of the results this morning. Uh, here you can see in the liver, so we know from the uh, biodistribution studies that a lot of vesicles are present in the liver. And here you can see red labeled vesicles inside uh, these, or associated with at least these uh, endothelial cells in the liver. Uh, and also uh, in macrophages in the liver. So these are F480, this is a marker of macrophages, or some macrophages. And here again, you can see in the liver that we have vesicles present in some, but not all of the uh, macrophages in the liver. What about the spleen? So you remember that in the biodistribution study that uh, Mansi did, that we didn't uh, detect vesicles in the spleen at the organ level. But when we look uh, at the microscopic level, what we can see is that actually there are a lot of vesicles in the spleen interacting with um, immune cells. So what I'm showing you here uh, is uh, different populations of macrophages in the spleen. Uh, here we can see uh, vesicles present in macrophages in the uh, red pulp. And these macrophages, uh, their primary job is to get rid of a feet um, red cells. Whereas uh, there is a structure in the spleen called the marginal zone that contains at least two different populations of macrophages, one shown by this marker, um, Marco. Um, and here again, you can see that in this immune zone in the spleen that we have vesicles interacting with maternal macrophages. And again, here, different type of macrophage, also in the um, marginal zone, the um, metallophilic macrophages. And one of their functions is to phagocytose apoptotic cells. And when a macrophage um, phagocytoses the remnants of an apoptotic cell, what it does is to produce a tolerant immune response. So an active tolerogenic response to those antigens. So potentially what we're seeing here is macrophages that are taking up uh, placental antigens that contain paternally encoded antigens. And maybe this is a potential mechanism by which we could get maternal tolerance um, in the immune system to the paternal antigens that are present in the placenta and fetus. So there needs to be a lot more work done on that before we can uh, get to that conclusion. So just to summarize uh, where we are, this study is still ongoing. Um, when we look in the liver, we can see interactions of extracellular vesicles with endothelial cells uh, and with macrophages, a total leukocyte population as well. In the spleen, we see very little interaction with T cells, but there is a little. Uh, there's a little more interaction with B cells and also with all three populations of macrophages that we've looked at in the spleen. Uh, and when we look in the lungs, we also see interactions uh, with some macrophages and with the endothelial cells as well. So clearly um, those uh, biodistribution studies are not picking up some of these interactions. And uh, you, can, you can see that quite clearly here in this slide that we've got these macrophages that are clearly in the spleen taking up uh, placental extracellular vesicles, but we certainly didn't see those when we looked at the organ level. Okay, so for the last few minutes, I just want to leave the immune system and talk to you very briefly about the maternal cardiovascular adaptations that occur in pregnancy and the role that extracellular vesicles from the placenta may have in regulating and dysregulating those adaptations. So during pregnancy, uh, mum has to provide oxygen and nutrients to that very rapidly growing fetus. And in order to do that, she increases her pulse rate between uh, 10 and 15%. And she also increases the stroke volume of her heart. So the amount of blood that is pumped at each, um, with each pulse is 10% greater uh, and the number of pulses goes up. And then mum also increases her blood volume by about 50%. So there are massive changes going on in the cardiovascular system of mum to accommodate uh, the fetus. Now, if you or I, 
increased our pulse rate by 10 or 15% and our stroke volume by 10 and then our blood volume by 50% on top of that, and we didn't do anything to compensate for that, we would rapidly become hypertensive and I suspect that would be quite fatal. So pregnant women uh, have a cunning plan to avoid that. So in pregnancy, there's a compensatory decrease in peripheral vascular resistance. So those small blood vessels that control um, our vascular resistance relax during a normal pregnancy and that allows mum to increase all of those uh, cardiovascular changes without becoming hypertensive. That's what happens in most pregnancies. But there is a condition in human pregnancy and it is unique to human pregnancy called preeclampsia. And preeclampsia is characterized by um, elevated blood pressure in the second half of pregnancy. Uh, and that can cause multi-organ damage and can progress to the full-blown condition of eclampsia, which may be fatal. And this disease causes the deaths of about 60,000 young women around the world every year. And it's one of the leading causes of maternal deaths in the USA. Now we don't know at this stage exactly what it is that controls either those increases that I've talked about above or the compensatory decrease in peripheral vascular resistance. We really, um, we have some thoughts, but really don't know the answer to what controls those changes. So uh, these are some experiments uh, which were um, conducted by Joe Stanley from the Liggins Institute here in Auckland, along with Mansi, um, when we were um, loading extracellular vesicles into uh, pregnant mice. And I'm just gonna talk to you about nano vesicles here for a second. So what we did was that at the end of these experiments, after we had injected the nano vesicles into the mice, uh, Joe dissected out the second order mesenteric arteries. So these are very small arteries that are very important in controlling total peripheral vascular resistance. Uh, she loaded them onto a wire myograph. That's a very challenging uh, technique. And then tested the ability of those vessels to contract or relax in response to a number of vasoactive stimuli. And I'm just gonna to talk to you about one of them today. So we're looking here at endothelium dependent vasodilation in response to acetylcholine. And what we saw was that we had two different responses. So when we looked in the mice uh, at 30 minutes, um, sorry, this is a bit of a confusing graph because we've got so many lines on it, but the uh, black line here, uh, control vessels taken from uh, animals with control vesicles and the red line is the um, relaxation in uh, animals that have been exposed to placental nanovesicles for 30 minutes. And you can see there's a significant difference. Now, when we looked at the vessels from animals that have been exposed to the vesicles for 24 hours, we also saw a significant difference between the green line and the blue line. And these differences uh, Still a little confusing to us, but what I think we're looking at is uh, a change that's affected by things carried on the vesicles themselves here. So a very acute response to the vesicles uh, and vasoactive substances that we know that they carry and potentially a longer term uh, response uh, that's induced by vesicles being taken up um, by cells in the maternal cardiovascular system producing a different type of um, long-term response. Regardless of, of that, what these experiments tell us is that these uh, placental nanovesicles from normal placenta are able to change the maternal or reset the maternal vascular tone. So they are certainly contributing to vascular tone uh, in women, in pregnant women. That's what happens in the normal situation. Um, we're interested in preeclampsia, that uh, uh, hypertensive disease of pregnancy. And these are some very preliminary results uh, which are being generated by Dr. Sandy Lau, who's a postdoc in the lab. Um, and these experiments are ongoing. I'm just showing you what we have to date. And if you just ignore the pink line and look at the black line, which is um, the contractile or relaxation response of these vessels. So again, we have taken uh, pregnant mice, we have injected them this time with 
extracellular vesicles from preeclamptic placentae. And what you can see uh, is that here we have um, a significantly different response from the controls of vesicles uh, from early onset preeclampsia, which is the more severe form of this disease. And again, if you look at the pink line, which is late onset preeclampsia, usually a milder form of the disease, you can see that the line is significantly different to the control vesicles, but um, not as different as that from early onset preeclampsia. So again, we have to be very careful in how we interpret these results because they are very preliminary and we haven't yet got um, as many numbers as we would like and these, this work is going on. But clearly this is showing that the vesicles from preeclamptic, uh, particularly early onset preeclamptic placenta, are altering the vascular tone uh, in pregnant mothers, so in these pregnant mice. So that's our takeaway message um, from that. So hopefully today uh, I've been able to convince you that placental extracellular vesicles, regardless of their size, have a tropism for the lungs. They also travel to the liver uh, and to the kidneys, at least when imaged at the organ levels. And we have to treat those biodistribution studies uh, with a degree of caution because of the sensitivity of the stains and instruments that we are currently able to use. Uh, this is not a criticism of the studies or the people who have conducted them. This is simply uh, where our technology sits today is not as good as it could be. And we hope for better technology in the future because we may miss important um, in vivo interactions. Um, we see that there is uh, a significantly uh, lower interaction of uh, placental microEVs, at least with leukocytes in vivo than what is seen in vitro. Um, but there is still an interaction of uh, placental EVs with um, leukocytes, cells of the immune system in, vit uh, in vivo. And that in interaction of placental EVs with leukocytes is greater when those leukocytes are present in the situation of pregnancy. So something about pregnancy is modifying the maternal immune environment and increasing the interaction of mum's leukocytes um, with extracellular vesicles in the circulation. Um, and we've seen that in the circulation, um, EVs are interacting with a small number of B cells and also with monocytes. Uh, and in the uh, liver and spleen, we see uh, an interaction of the vesicles with macrophages uh, and other cells of the maternal immune system. And we ask the question, is there an important function here where that interaction is leading to the um, active to, uh, tolerization of the maternal immune system to the fetus and its placenta. And uh, I've shown you some preliminary results there that um, normal EVs and preeclamptic EVs can reset maternal vascular tone and that there is a dysregulation of that vascular tone in preeclampsia. And finally, I'd just like to thank the people who did uh, all the work. We have a large team of people who have worked on this project over quite a number of years now. And I'd also like to thank our funding bodies, the New Zealand Health Research Council, the Marsden Fund of the Royal Society of New Zealand, uh, the Auckland Medical Research Foundation and uh, Freemasons. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, thank you so much, um, Larry, for what a wonderful presentations. Um, wait a second, I'll just stop the screen share. Okay, yeah, uh, everyone, if you have uh, questions, please uh, write down on the chat and then uh, I'll call you out uh, so you can ask the questions directly to Larry. I think uh, I've got the first questions. Um, I'm just wondering whether you know uh, about the origin for the extracellular vesicles in the placenta. Is it from the blood cells, uh, platelet, or is it from SPDs? No. Uh, do so, you know about that? So they're coming from the syncytia trophoblast largely. So you've got a, this huge cell, uh, which is producing um, 
the vesicles, and they are predominantly from the syncytia trophoblast. Oh, okay. So, so we eliminate um, CD45 positive and and other yeah. vesicles during our prep. I didn't go into the details of that. Oh, we, okay. We eliminate right. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, uh, when you um, say that uh, you have equivalent extracellular vesicles in vitro and in vivo, is that based on the particle number, or is it based on uh, sometimes people use like protein concentrations from EV. Are you using? Yeah, so we used, uh, I think it was particle count there. Mm. Um, and so we use a nanosite to count our particles. Um, and, and it's a guesstimate that we had equivalent mm. amounts because you have to guesstimate what, the, guesstimate what the blood volume of the animal is. And, and so it was as good as we can, could do. Oh. Yeah, basically. Oh. Uh, I was actually thinking more about like sort of based on, I don't know. Oh yeah, actually that's quite interesting. How how do you get the equivalent number? Um, yeah, so we spent a long time <laughs> pondering yeah. how to do this. <laughs> and, yeah, can you give us yeah. advice please? <laughs> how to do that? <laughs> Yeah, if you if you want to know more about how we did that, we can, we can talk <laughs> yeah, offline. But yeah. basically, we were working off estimates of the blood volume of the mouse um, mm. and uh, work backwards from there. Okay, cool. I think I'll be interested to know a little bit more about that details. Um, okay, I'll go first to the uh, first question. It's Kalyan. Uh, Kalyan, if you go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Larry. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. So, uh, in addition to various organs, uh, I was just wondering uh, whether the biodistribution of placental EVs is studied in the bone marrow. And the second part is uh, that uh, in addition to the circulating immune cells, so uh, uh, do you think that the placental EVs can actually interact with the HSCs or the lymphoid myeloid progenitors because they are playing a role in the maternal immune system as a whole. So um, maybe they can, uh, do they have the capacity to actually influence the production of immune cells too? So great questions. Thank you very much. So uh, we have looked in the bone marrow and uh, it's, it's challenging to do those experiments um, at the same time as you're doing all of the other experiments. Um, I, I have only a vague memory that we didn't pursue that because the interactions were essentially um, much smaller than we saw mm -hmm. in the periphery. Now that okay. doesn't mean they're not important. So with Sorry. regard to your second suggestion, you know, and I talked about how few cells, uh, so less than I think it was 0.01% of cells in the circulation were interacting with vesicles. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if those are cells that are recognizing paternal antigen, uh, even though they're a small number, then that's incredibly important. And the same with progenitors. If they are interacting mm -hmm. with a small number of uh, very relevant progenitors, then that might be mm -hmm. more important than interactions with large numbers of, of essentially irrelevant cells. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's actually quite interesting that uh, both nanofascicles and microfascicles went primarily to the lung from the placental EV. Um, is there any sort of like functional um, effect on them? Like differentiate between the nanofascicles and the microfascicles? How about the targeting molecule? Are they, yeah. Do they have the same uh, targeting molecule? So the, the short answer to that is we don't know, and we're mm. starting to look at, at that question. What, you know, it's sort of easy to assume that what we're seeing there is a first pass effect. So that these vesicles, we inject them via a tail vein, mm. uh, which is very similar to the route that a vesicle takes from the placenta. So it, it's traveling uh, via large veins through the vena cava to the lungs. And again, the lungs are the first small vascular bed that these vesicles hit after we inject them. And so, you know, it's tempting to assume that this is a first pass effect, uh, also reinforced by the finding that the vesicles seem to move from the lungs to other organs when we look at uh, the 24 hour time point. So there's a bit of a shift around the animal's body. Um, 
but you know, I suspect that there is something more than just that. Mm, so there is some sort of tropism there. Yeah, because the the um the beads that you injected us, uh, I assume, is through the same route yep. as well, and it goes is actually to the liver. Yeah, so to the liver mm. and the spleen, which mm. um, yeah, so so there is some sort of interaction, and it might be a um, an interaction that's relatively tenuous, but uh, clearly there's something going on. But if you look in that um, when we did the uh, systematic review. Um, Matt found again that nanovesicles, regardless of what cell they were isolated from, uh, there was a tropism for the lungs, you know, uh, and that was regardless, I think, of whether they were injected IP or IV. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's something mm. that's more than just a random effect there. Uh, how important it is, I don't know. Mm. Um, would that be good to assume it's best to uh, observe at a later time point at 24 hours rather than 30 minutes? Um, I personally think that we should do time courses and I think that 24 hours is not long enough. So um, again, in that systematic review, almost every uh, group who's done this sort of biodistribution study finished at 24 hours. There are a couple that went on out to 72 hours. We have now done some um, out to six months. And Six months. Uh, yeah. Wow. And <laughs> are they still are, are they still at the same organ? Um, the uh, well, what we know is that we can still detect signal. It's almost certainly not vesicles, but this there's still it's really quite confusing for us. There is signal that we injected still present in some of the maternal organs, and we can see that both at the organ level and at the microscopic level. Um, but yeah, that that's really confusing to us. Hmm. So uh, also, I think it's really interesting uh, with the functions in the cardiovascular. Um, is, is there some sort of like a candidate cargo that um, can explain the effect of that uh, vesicle? Um, we know that, uh, so Ian Sargent's group from Oxford have published, as have we, that there are vasoactive molecules carried by extracellular vesicles. So we know that um, FLIP1 is carried on these vesicles. We know that they are capable of generating nitric oxide. Uh, so those are both vasoactive. Uh, and there are no doubt many other molecules uh, that mm. we don't yet uh, know about carried by these vesicles. Um, that can certainly have an acute effect and there are probably other factors that are going to have a, a more chronic effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very interesting study and uh, very valuable information in terms of the biodistribution and um, I think the way you set up uh, in vitro and in vivo study is very neat as well. I really love that. Um, so I think I think there is no more questions from the audience. Uh, unless uh, there is a final questions, please, um, you know, raise your hands. But um, I think uh, we can wrap up the session. So thank you so much again, Larry, for the wonderful presentation and sharing so much of your research. And I learned so much today about the maternal uh, EVs and how they um, involve in the uh, pregnancy and also in the preeclampsia. Uh, 